The principle of mentalism is the simplest and yet the most important of the Hermetic principles. From this one principle, the general framework of Hermeticism can be derived. This principle tells us, in simple terms, that the universe is mental, held in the mind of the all. However, even though the principle of mentalism is the simplest of all the principles, it is perhaps the most counterintuitive. After all, the world around us seems to be quite material. The very notion that it could be otherwise seems to be like complete nonsense. The other issue seems to be how is it that this principle could possibly be translated into science? After all, isn't science just the study of the material world and not a mental reality? Well, perhaps common beliefs on closer inspection, on the fundamental physics describing the nature of what material objects actually are, it turns out that matter as thought of as existing outside and independent of consciousness does not actually exist at all. In other words, it can be shown quite naturally that there is no reality beyond consciousness and thus there is no reality outside of the mental. In order to understand how science can arrive at mentalism, we must start looking at physics. Max Planck, who is perhaps the greatest quantum physicist who has ever lived, is a clear example of someone who through science concluded that the principle of mentalism is true. Quote, As a man who has devoted his entire life to the most clear-headed science in the study of matter, I can tell you as a matter of my research about the atoms this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of force, which brings a particle and an atom to vibration, and holds this most minute solar system of the atoms together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is a matrix of all matter. As we proceed throughout this video, we shall see why Planck's scientific conclusion is quite unavoidable. The first clue as to why the principle of mentalism is true arises in the study of quantum mechanics. To understand quantum mechanics and how it leads necessarily to the conclusion of the principle of mentalism, it is necessary to start with a little history of quantum mechanics. Quantum theory began in the 20th century with the discovery of Max Planck that black box radiation cannot be solved unless light was treated as a particle. This particle is called a photon, and it had discrete energy called a quantum. This first originated with the double slit experiment almost a century earlier by the physicist Thomas Young. The double slit experiment demonstrates that light sent through a pair of slits in a barrier radiated equally from those two slits. As those waves cross past each other, they would interfere with each other to form a series of bands behind the slits. If light were a particle, however, it was thought that these series of bands would not exist as no concrete wave fonts would exist to create them. Rather, if they were particles, they would simply form a pair of clumps on the film where the photons were projected through the slits like bullets from a rifle. However, while the double slit experiment showed light to be wave, Planck demonstrated that light had to be compromised of particles, thus light behaved as both a wave and a particle. Much later, in the year 1924, physicists demonstrated that just as waves of light are somehow particles, elementary particles such as electrons and photons behave as waves, which forms what's called an interference pattern. However, this created a paradox. So to resolve this paradox, Edward Schrödinger proposed a strange idea in 1926 with the discovery of the Schrödinger equation. His solution was to suggest that the photon and the electron are indeed both particles and waves. When they are observed, however, they are a particle with defined states and have a defined location in space. However, when they are not observed, they do not have a defined state but are smeared out in what's called a wave of probable locations and states in what's called a superposition. The mathematical description of superpositions is what's called the wave function, and it is described by the Schrodinger equation. However, this does not make sense without some natural intuitions about our world. Matter, as we conceive of it, has location in space, and will have definite properties whether or not we are looking at it. However, quantum mechanics tells us that this is not the case. So, Later experiments tried to modify the conditions, where single particles was being slant through the slit one at a time. They did this so that with only one particle going through, there is literally nothing else for it to be interfering with. However, the individual particles once again collectively formed an interference pattern on the back screen. So they had to be interfering with something, and yet there is nothing else other than themselves to be interfering with. So it was found that there really is a 
probabilistic wave function of possible states, rather than definite states. Now, if one were to measure or observe which of the two slits your electron actually goes through, then they suddenly found that the electron produced clumps patterns once again, rather than wave patterns. Merely observing the electron causes it to take on a definite state, as a particle with defined properties. The effect of taking on definite states upon observation is called the collapse of the wave function. The question now as to what exactly is an observation. Many will try to say that the observation is in fact only the measurement of the experimental apparatus, where it is merely just the interaction between the physical particles, and they would not be wrong in asserting this. However, they would be wrong in asserting that this means that consciousness does not also play a role in measurement. After all, experimental apparatuses are themselves made of quantum particles and thus must be themselves be measured to take on a definite state. So who or what collapses their wave functions? We quickly see here that the collapse is not some objective event that happens only with respect to one object or another. Rather, it is subjective to the reference frame of who or what is doing the measurement. And this would include, necessarily, the conscious agent as a reference frame for collapsing wave functions. Some will try to say that decoherence causes collapse long before any conscious mind observe it. The problem, however, is what exactly causes this decoherence in the first place. Advocates of decoherence will say that this is the environment. However, this answer is insufficient for two reasons. First, the environment itself is made of more quantum particles. So why would the collective wave function of particles compromising the environment be collapsed if someone or something has not observed them as well? Secondly, why isn't consciousness part of the environment? With these problems pointed out, it becomes obvious that the assumptions underlying decoherence cannot make any sense without consciousness being involved in the process. The sort of physicalists who make these claims also reject the notion that the mind is anything beyond science. However, if this is the case, they would have no grounds on which to specially exclude the mind from collapse of the wave function, if every other object studied by science does collapse the wave function. In fact, the only way in which consciousness can be excluded as a potential quantum measurer is through special pleading. So then, the mind must be an exception to the physical world, which is, which is exactly the some sort of dualistic doctrines that these physicalists at the same time want to oppose. With this in mind, it betrays an unjustified prejudice solely for the purposes of justified physicalism against the weight of the scientific evidence. So, we see our first connection between the fundamental level of physics and the mentality of the world. Fundamental physics is affected in some way by the mind through the observer effect. Now, some physicalists will try to posit there is some hidden variables in nature that are really causing the collapse of the wave function and not consciousness. These hidden variable theories have two classes. The first is local hidden variable theories, and the second is non-local hidden variable theories. It should be noted, however, that Allen Aspect actually demonstrated that local hidden variables do not exist. Indeed, he showed Einstein's spooky action at a distance was real, and if two particles are separated at a great distance, then the activity of measuring one of the particles would determine its state, and thereby also instantaneously determine the state of the other particle that it is entangled with. Furthermore, a later study found that entanglement was an inevitable future of any theory which supersedes classical physics. Entanglement happens when two particles interact in a way where their quantum states cannot be described independently. However, if you separate them by a great distance, an effect on one should have an effect on the other regardless of the space between them. So, with this evidence in mind, if hidden variables do exist, then they would have to be no the non-local kind. However, there is a problem with this. The collapse of the wave function occurs instantaneously. So, if there exists any hidden variable theories, given the pre-existing quantum state of physical reality, then they must be influencing the second particle infinitely fast. However, according to special relativity, nothing can travel faster than light, including any hidden variables in nature. Thus, non-local hidden variables are also violations of the laws of physics. This fact alone demonstrates that whatever is linking these entangled particles cannot be in physical space-time, as physical space-time entails existence within space-time. Now, some try to argue that this only applies to the micro-world and not the macro-world. However, there is nothing in science that restricts one set of laws on one level of reality to another set of laws on another level of reality. Instead, 
the true laws of physics are uniform in all levels. Furthermore, the Liggett-Garg inequality has been used to test this hypothesis, and macrorealism has failed these experiments. More experiments like the test of the Cochin Spectre Theorem and the bizarre quantum Chazier Cat experiments demonstrate that the concept of scientific materialism is based on ignorance of what the actual science says. As Wiener Heisenberg says, the ontology of materialism rests upon the illusion that the kind of existence, the directly actuality of the world around us, can be extrapolated into the atomic range. This extrapolation, however, is impossible. Now, given all this evidence, some try to argue that no one really understands quantum mechanics and thus no conclusions can be drawn from it. These arguments suggest that quantum mechanics is philosophically problematic, and thus we should only treat quantum mechanics as a tool rather than telling us anything about reality. However, quantum mechanics in fact does not have any philosophical problems. It only has philosophical inconsistencies with the metaphysics of materialism. So, when it is argued that no one understands quantum mechanics, what is really being said is that no one understands quantum mechanics on materialistic grounds. However, these opinions are extra-scientific and not part of science itself. We have seen that when we look at the actual science, it leads directly to a picture of the world that is incompatible with materialism, and it involves a picture of the world where mind is an observer. Here, the viewer is encouraged to remember that when these sort of opinions are asserted without evidence, they can be equally well dismissed by not having evidence. Now that we have examined the observer effect, let's now jump to quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is the project of trying to combine quantum physics with Einstein's theory of general relativity. However, quantum gravity is an unfinished process. Despite it being unfinished, however, there are some ideas in quantum gravity that have reached general agreement among physicists. We will be now looking into these sort of ideas that are agreed upon, and we shall show that this very much derives the principle of mentalism. The first of these ideas is called the holographic principle. It says that the entire three-dimensional universe emerges from two-dimensional information processing. The holographic principle was only an idea at first, but then, in 2017 this changed when a study confirmed evidence for the holographic principle. The holographic model was compared to the standard model, and it found it to be a better model than the standard model, mainly by making non propagative predictions for Lodz angle statistics of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This means that the universe we experience would emerge from the quantum realm. Take me, for example. I seem real enough, don't I? Well, yes. But surprising new clues are emerging that everything, you and I and even space itself, may actually be a kind of hologram. That is, everything we see and experience, everything we call our familiar three-dimensional reality, may be a projection of information that's stored on a thin, distant, two-dimensional surface sort of the way the information for this hologram is stored on this thin piece of plastic. Now, holograms are something we're all familiar with, from the security symbol you find on most credit cards. But the universe is a hologram? That's one of the most drastic revisions to our picture of space and reality ever proposed. And the evidence for it comes from some of the strangest realms of space black holes. This is a real disconnect and it's very hard to get your head around. Modern ideas coming from black holes tell us that reality is two-dimensional. That the three-dimensional world, the full-bodied three-dimensional world, is a kind of image of a hologram on the boundary of the region of space. This is a very strange thing. When I was a younger physicist, I would have thought any physicist who said that was absolutely crazy. Here's a way to think about this. Imagine I took my wallet and threw it into a black hole. What would happen? We used to think that since nothing, not even light, can escape the immense gravity of a black hole, my wallet would be lost forever. But it now seems that may not be the whole story. 
Recently, scientists exploring the math describing black holes made a curious discovery. Even as my wallet disappears into the black hole, a copy of all the information it contains seems to get smeared out and stored on the surface of the black hole in much the same way that information is stored in a computer. So, in the end, my wallet exists in two places. There's a three-dimensional version that's lost forever inside the black hole, and a two-dimensional version that remains on the surface as information. The information content of all the stuff that fell into that black hole can be expressed entirely in terms of just the outside of the black hole. The idea then is that you can capture what's going on inside the black hole by referring only to the outside. And in theory, I could use the information on the outside of the black hole to reconstruct my wallet. And here's the truly mind-blowing part. Space within a black hole plays by the same rules as space outside a black hole or anywhere else. So if an object inside a black hole can be described by information on the black hole surface, then it might be that everything in the universe, from galaxies and stars to you and me, even space itself, is just a projection of information stored on some distant two-dimensional surface that surrounds us. In other words, what we experience as reality may be something like a hologram. Is the three-dimensional world an illusion in the same sense that a hologram is an illusion? Perhaps. I think, I'm inclined to think, yes, that the three-dimensional world is a kind of illusion and uh, that the ultimate precise reality is the two-dimensional reality at the surface of the universe. This idea is so new that physicists are still struggling to understand it. But if it's right, just as Newton and Einstein completely changed our picture of space, we may be on the verge of an even more dramatic revolution. Furthermore, perhaps the biggest discovery relating to quantum gravity is the discovery that space-time itself is emergent. We should remember that in quantum mechanics, prior to measurement, particles have no defined properties or locations. They simply exist as a wave function of possible states they could take. This includes the space they take up. So space emerges only after measurement. Space is the illusion that particles are separated, not a fundamental feature of reality. Physicist Hang Yang says that emergent space-time is the new fundamental paradigm from quantum gravity. However, it is not just space that emerges. Under Einstein's theory of general relativity, space and time are one. So that, that would mean that time is also emergent from the quantum realm. And an experiment in 2013 illustrates that time is emergent from entanglement as well. This all implies that everything we experience, which is space, time, and matter, are not fundamental to reality, but come from a deeper layer of reality, as Sean Carroll explains. Mathematically, wave functions are elements of a mathematical structure called Hubbard space. This means that they are vectors. We can add quantum states together and calculate the angle between them. The word space in Hilbert space does not mean the good old three-dimensional space-time we walk through every day, or even the four-dimensional space-time of relativity. It is just math speak for a collection of things, in this case, possible quantum states of the universe. So, this deeper layer of reality which is from which our classical world emerges from is called Hilbert space. Thus, our universe emerges from Hilbert space. Adding on to this, Brian Whitworth looked at things in our universe and compared them to what we would expect in a virtual or emergent world. He found there are key 11 features to the universe that are better explained by the idea that we are in a virtual or emergent reality rather than a reality with fundamental space, time, and matter. Things in our universe like the maximum speed, quantum tunneling, and wave function collapse all make sense in a emergent reality rather than a fundamental reality. So. This would only add on to the evidence we already discussed. Now, the question is, how did this evidence derive the principle of mentalism? Well, the things that we have gone over so far is only half of the picture. The other half of the picture has to do with the larger field of quantum cognition. This first arose with the realization that the math behind quantum mechanics can readily be modeled with the, the fuzzy logic behavior of the human mind, which just so happens to act like quantum superposition. 
Some may try to argue that while it's true that our decision making can be modeled quantum mechanically, that doesn't mean that our minds are actually quantum mechanical, but are just still classical. However, trying to simulate a quantum bit from a classical bit would create exponential slowdown, since it would all need to unpack into classical bits, and this applies to our minds and our brains as well. So, it is extremely unlikely that our minds are not quantum mechanical in some way. Matthew Fisher has gone on so far to show that there has been psychological changes in rats due to direct alterations in their quantum biology. So you might well ask, and I did four years ago, how does lithium work? Well, you might well ask, in fact, how do any psychiatric pharmaceuticals work? And the answer is, embarrassingly, that we have no idea, the neuroscientists have no idea, the neuroscience community has, has basically no idea, um, and because if you're really trying to understand uh, you know, the effects of drugs on the uh, conscious state, on the tenet of the conscious state, you really ultimately have to understand the biochemical mechanisms underlying consciousness, underlying awareness. How on earth could this possibly be that the two isotopes of lithium have an opposite effect on the sign of the mood of these uh, female rats? Well, okay, there's a mass ratio of seven to six, not so big. Um, but what's remarkable is the nuclear spin entanglement time. I showed you this uh, 10 seconds. Well, it turns out that for li that's for lithium-7. Lithium-6 is five minutes. I don't know about you, but my memory is much, not much longer than five minutes. And when I saw that, I was like, good Lord, could it really be that evolution had you know, undergone the uh, process where nuclear spins you know, became um, qubits in a quantum processing uh, in the brain and that our brains are some sort of quantum computer. With all this to take into account, it's clear that since we can model conscious thought processes as existing in Hilbert space, given the evidence from quantum cognition, and a space-time is emergent from Hilbert space, then when combining quantum cognition with the emergent space-time, the most parsimonious explanation matching the evidence is that space-time emerges from consciousness. However, to account for the emergence of the physical world from underlying consciousness, we first need to account for consciousness in terms of physics, so we need what's called a consciousness-based physics. Surprisingly, candidates for this already exist that allow for consciousness to create space-time. These include the conscious realism of Donald Hoffman and the informational idealism of Daniel Tooker. Conscious realism attempts to derive physics in a bottom-up fashion, from simple interacting conscious agents. This approach has been good at successfully replicating the space-time of general relativity, as well as the wave function of quantum mechanics. In other words, it explains why the wave function takes the form it does, rather than just being a useful tool for predicting things in quantum physics. And it also explains why we get general relativity, rather than just making predictions from general relativity. The math involved also includes something called the combination theorem, which demonstrates that systems of interacting conscious agents themselves constitute a single conscious agent, but that this conscious agent is still distinct from the other conscious agents. Informational idealism, on the other hand, is proposed by Daniel Tooker, and it comes to the conclusion that information is essentially identical with experience and comes before the material. He borrows from integrated information theory and shows that consciousness is identical to information in the form of thoughts and perceptions, and that these in turn are identical to entanglement, and, as was shown before, space-time emerges from entanglement, thus space-time emerges from consciousness. Also, when this view is combined with the relational quantum mechanics, the definition of consciousness as entanglement happens to produce the same result as the combination theorem mentioned before. So, both information idealism and conscious realism have a physics-based description of how space-time emerges from consciousness. Notice that both these models are consciousness-based physics, and actually explain why things are the R, rather than just making simple predictions from them. Here, we are not just simply making predictions from quantum mechanics and general relativity, and leaving themselves unexplained, rather, we are predicting quantum mechanics and general relativity themselves from this consciousness-based physics. If I start with consciousness, I have to... Am I out of time? Uh, if I'm going to to solve the mind-body problem, I can assume that physics is fundamental, and then my burden is to get consciousness. Or what I'm trying to do is the opposite. I assume consciousness is fundamental. Then my burden is to show that all of physics comes out of it, quantum mechanics and so forth comes out of this, and it and it does. So uh, 
this is an abstract agent dynamics where it's a very simple, each agent can only see one bit of information, zero or one. And you can actually program up these things. I, I won't, this is two agents passing information back and forth, zeros or ones. All. And it turns out that when you look at the um, long-term dynamics of these, I'll, I'll just, you'll have to take my word on this. Um, when you look at the long-term dynamics, the states of the two agents become entangled. You actually have an entanglement of the, and this is the title of my talk, conscious agents actually get entangled because they have different kinds of asymptotic long-term behaviors. And it turns out that when you look at that long-term behavior and write it down, um, So this is, the top was the conscious agent dynamics, long-term behavior. And then if you write down the, the wave equation for the free particle in quantum mechanics, it's exactly the same equation. So we can actually read off, this is the non-relativistic case, you can actually read off a one-to-one -one mapping between non-relativistic quantum mechanics and this agent dynamics. And I won't go through it, this is the, the actual read-off of the equivalence between space and time and aspects of consciousness. Um, and if you're interested, I've got a paper that, that has the details that we don't have time for. But you can even read off energy and momentum from this. Now, that's non-relativistic, and I'll close by the relativistic. I mean, the ultimate thing is we want to have a relativistic quantum theory falling out of a theory of consciousness. And the direction I'm going on that, and I'm starting to collaborate with Chris Fields and some others on this, is to actually take a system of two conscious agents, and it turns out it can be represented by something called a geometric algebra that I've written down there. And th that geometric algebra is precisely the geometric algebra that describes um, the relativistic um, quantum free particle, massless particle. So, it, so the idea is that we can get um, space-time coming out of this, um, Dirac spinners, and ultimately, you know, using Penrose twist, uh, twisters, maybe even quantum gravity. So the idea is that this program, for it to be successful, has to start with consciousness and give us all of quantum physics. And then we've solved the mind-body problem going the other way. A theory which explains why things are as they are has superior explanatory power to a theory that simply takes for granted why things are as they are. And given that these models both involve consciousness as the starting point for deriving all of quantum mechanics and general relativity, that perhaps consciousness-based physics is the correct framework for solving many of the problems in physics. It may even supersede quantum mechanics and general relativity in the same way that quantum mechanics supersedes classical mechanics or how Einstein's theory supersedes Newton's theory. So, if consciousness is identified with information, as described before, and the relational nature of quantum mechanics is brought into play, whether or not these are separate systems is irrelevant to one's frame of reference. From a higher frame, two things can be in superposition together and therefore entangled, but from a lower frame, neither sees the other two as in superposition. Thus, they would represent separate conscious minds on one frame, yet would constitute a single mind on higher frame. Thus, entangled information systems would achieve the same result with the combination theory. In either case, however, any wave function entangling any other system would constitute a single constant agent. This would naturally include the wave function of the entire universe, and thus, the entire universe would be contained in a single mind containing everything, which is what is referred to as God by religion. With all this in mind, it's clear that the principle of mentalism can be fully derived from these physics, and that the existence of God is also derived from these physics. The relational nature of conscious agents can also explain how beings within God are not actually God themselves. This helps make sense in light of the relational nature of both entanglement and therefore conscious states or agents in this model. The all of course, or God, would refer to all of these separate conscious agents existing within the all. However, the all itself is still distinct or is a distinct conscious agent containing all of these other interacting conscious agents. A human being looks at the cat. I am conscious. Therefore, consciousness determines existence. At that point, Einstein went ballistic and said, what? You're saying that the fact that you are a conscious being determines the fact that the cat is alive? 
answer is yes. And Wigner made one more step. And that is, how do I know I'm alive? You see, the cat and me, we're part of the same universe. If I don't know the cat is alive or dead, I could also be dead at the same time and not even know it. So who determines that I'm alive? Well, Wigner's friend looks at me, I look at the cat, and we exist. But then who looks at Wigner's friend? And there's an infinite chain of people looking at people, looking at people, until finally you hit cosmic consciousness. Some consciousness that's ethereal, that envelops the universe, which looks at us and says, Aha! The cat is alive. Thus, the hermetic principle of mentalism can be shown to be fully replicated by modern physics and quantum models of cognitive science. This also gives us a full scientific description of God, which is a concept that has only been discussed in the realm of religion. But now, we have a scientific derivation of God through consciousness-based physics. So, given the importance of this principle, the other hermetic principles of hermeticism can be derived as well, but we will explore more of that in a future video. However, it should be noted that we don't need this advanced physics to reach the conclusions of mentalism. We can get a full derivation of the principle in the arguments for idealism from philosophy of mind, as well as from the basic facts of reality. For those wishing to learn about those arguments, I will simply leave a link to the in the description, where viewers can go watch those other videos to get a different kind of derivation for the principle of mentalism. Since we have shown in previous videos on this channel that consciousness is an undeniable aspect of our reality, and yet given the hard problem of consciousness, then consciousness cannot be reduced to anything else, that consciousness is fundamental to reality. Remember that consciousness and experiences are the same, and so if experience is not fundamental to the brain, but rather the brain produces experience, then it necessarily leads to an experience being itself non-experiential, and thus you're left with a contradiction. This contradiction, of course, is why the mind cannot be reduced to matter. Therefore, given the physics described before and the emergence of space-time, since consciousness is fundamental, then it naturally follows that space-time emerges from consciousness, and therefore the principle of mentalism would still be true. It also follows that the only substance that we intuitively know, which is consciousness, we can only interact with the mental, since interactions in physics is defined in terms of shared properties, and so anything not having these shared properties of experiences or mental states cannot interact with consciousness, and therefore, we can intuitively know that the principle of mentalism is true from basic physics as well as the realization that consciousness cannot be reduced to anything else. So, the most parsimonious conclusion is that all is mind, the universe is mental, and that a god exists. For more information, the main book in this that is based on this series, you can check out the Quantum Hermetica, where you can find more details about the relationships between modern physics and occult science.